What's up, everybody? This is Jeff Jarena. Welcome to the Men Plug Show. So excited to have you here today. I'm going to be talking about how to embrace your brokenness for a life of freedom with my guest, Mark Johnson. But before we do that, I want to give you a quick update about my book that I'm publishing this summer. This book takes the guesswork and fear out of sharing your faith to anyone you come across at any time, anywhere. Created from a course that I launched back in 2008, this book will help you crush any fear that you have about sharing your faith, as well as provide you with easy-to-follow lessons, real-life witnessing accounts, a simple template for sharing your testimony, biblical explanations, and practical examples to unleash your witnessing skills. Right now, I'm working on the final edits, the book title, and the book cover as we speak, and we're projecting a publishing date for sometime this summer, 2019. With that said, I've got a special bonus for you. Now, if you're part of the Men Unplugged email list and you're one of the first 300 to purchase a hard copy of the book, I'm going to give you a special discounted copy of the book, a free audio digital download of the book, and some other freebies as well. So make sure you sign up to the email list at menunplugged.net by clicking the sign up now button. So the big question is this, how do we as warriors of Jesus Christ, men of God who want to stay battle ready, who want to honor the Lord, and who want to grow in our daily walk, unplug from those things that weigh us down so we can ignite our faith, strengthen our family, and ultimately succeed in every aspect of life? That is the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Jarena, and welcome to Men Unplugged. Hey everyone, welcome back to Men Unplugged. If you haven't subscribed to the show and you're on iTunes or Apple Podcast, please subscribe and leave us a rating and review. All right, let's get into that conversation with Mark Johnson, who is now in his 15th year as the voice of the Buffaloes, handling play-by-play duties for all of the University of Colorado football and basketball broadcast. Now, before his current position, he spent three years at Syracuse University announcing their football and men's basketball games. And he was the guy that was on the microphone calling the Orangemen's 2003 National Championship game, where I got to tell you, they barely sneaked past my Longhorn team in the semifinals on their way to that National Championship title. Mark, welcome to the show, brother. It is good to be on. We've talked about this for quite a while. I'm glad we've finally been able to find a time to get together and, and talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ and whatever other topic the, uh, the Holy Spirit leads us into. Absolutely. And you can tell right away, Men Unplugged, that this guy has a radio voice. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> and, and by the way, uh, generally a radio face comes along with that. So, Oh, no. Hey, I saw, I saw a picture of you, man. It's pretty good, though. Hey, come on. You, you're, you're being too humble. But okay, so here, before we really kick this thing in here, I want you to say hey to the Men Unplugged community and share something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. Uh, well, here, here's something kind of interesting. I, I, uh, I do a lot of horseback riding and some training and, and those kinds of things. I own horses. I've got a small ranch in the mountains of Colorado. Every July, so it's coming up here in about three weeks, I do a 100-mile wilderness ride with a group of guys. Wow. And so we're about ready to go out. We'll do 100 miles over the course of six days. We do 20, 20, and 20. Take a day off, let everybody rest a little bit, and then do twenty and twenty. And so it's it's a fun deal. It's a great uh, brotherhood event that I do with a, a group of very good men. And so that that's something kind of unique that I do that most people don't know about. Wow, that's cool. Now, is there a point during that particular ride that you and or your horse is like, man, I don't know if I can go any farther? <laughs> well, as big as I am, I'm six five, about two hundred sixty pounds. So as big as I'm, my horse probably gets there quicker than I do. <laughs> but, but, right. Uh, uh, yeah, she she does a good job. Um, it, it is grueling. It's it's pretty physically taxing, and that's a part of the training leading up to it. But but uh, when I get back, uh, let's just say in my fifty one year old body, I can feel it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, hey man, that that's a pretty cool thing. So I'm going to ask you. Let's get this thing going here. Are you ready to plug in and recharge? Let's do it, man. All right. So before we jump into the topic, Mark, I wanted to ask you. What's your favorite part of announcing games? Well, you know, it's something for, for those of us who do this for a living, and, and I, I think virtually to a man, they'll, they'll tell you the same thing. It, it's something that kind of struck us early. And 
And I've done both radio and television. I'm, I'm the voice of the Colorado Buffaloes, obviously, and, and do that on their radio network. Radio is the most pure form of doing play-by-play. Hmm. And what's fun about that, what you really enjoy about it, because on TV, anybody that's watching can see what's going on. So you don't have to tell them what's happening. You just have to kind of direct and make sure you use your, your analyst on uh, a television broadcast. On radio, you get to be the eyes, the ears, the senses of everybody who is listening to that game. So when you're doing that, you get to... Uh, Tell them what color the jerseys are. The, the smell of popcorns in the air in the arena or stadium. You get to tell them everything. And so that, that's what I really love about, especially doing a radio play-by-play. That's really cool. I like that. Now, so I actually do some announcing, too. Now, not at the level that you're at, but high school level. And, you know, one of the things that I really like is it's you get a different perspective being up in the box. You know, you're, <laughs> you're, you get a different viewpoint on what you can see. But there are some tough things about it. So I want to ask you, what is the toughest part for you? If you have any at all, what is the toughest part about it? Well, I'll throw this out as a good illustration. Uh, some of your listeners may remember that uh, ill, uh, shall we say, conceived idea that Monday Night had, Football had to put Dennis Miller, the comedian on Monday Night Football. Right. They may, they may or may not remember that, but there was a moment in his first game when Al Michaels said to Dennis Miller, it's beginning of the second half, as I recall, and he said, How's the experience been for you? And Dennis says, I feel like I'm sitting on the dotted line on a freeway and the cars are coming at me at 70 miles per hour mm. because everything happens so fast. I, I think that's the one thing that people don't understand is when you're doing a broadcast, you're explaining everything, you're describing everything, you're getting your sponsors in, you've got a, a producer talking in your ear, you've got an analyst you're trying to get in. There is so much going on and you can't stop, you can't start over, you can't make mistakes you can't go back and say you know i missed up on that play so let me explain what happened again right. because another place coming it, it's unbelievably fast and unbelievably busy and so that, that's probably the most difficult thing for people to learn when they're doing play by play no that's a good point i i would absolutely agree with you on that and because you have to see who's like in terms of football who threw the ball was there right, what right. what was the, you know who what defender what did the defender do was the pass completed who was in on the play, what was the numbers of the jersey, all these different things that you have to spot. Yep. You have a spotter that can help you. But a lot of times you're getting all this information and you have to say, okay, I don't want to say it exactly like I did the play or the two or three plays before. I have to rephrase the way I said the same thing that just happened, right? Oh, without question. You know, uh, years ago, I did the games for Syracuse University, and Syracuse product Bob Costas, everyone knows Bob. Right. Bob and I did a TV show talking about this very same topic one time, and he said, whenever somebody says, you know, I sit at home and I, I do that while I'm watching a game, he always kind of chuckles and says, start and, and start doing play-by-play for 10 minutes. Don't stop. Don't start over. Don't pause know every name, and he said that's always a great way to humble somebody. You know, it's one of those jobs that's kind of like coaching. Everyone thinks, oh, I could coach, or I could be a better official than that. They all think, I could do play-by-play. Try doing that for 10 minutes sometimes without stopping, you know, because everyone says, around my body, I do it all the time. Well, r- really do it sometime and give it a try and see how it works for you. Man, no kidding. Hey, we can keep talking about that, and I'll say this. I have a tough time sitting down, Mark, when I'm calling. i got to be standing okay. up because I'm. You, know, you get so much energy going. <laughs> a lot of guys are like that. I prefer to sit, but there are, I know a lot of guys. The guy I do football with, uh, Coach Gary Barnett, uh, was at Colorado and Northwestern. He, he has to stand a lot of times when he's doing the game. So that, that's, that's common for a, a lot of guys because they, that energy has to go someplace. So they stand up to burn it off. So I'm going to bring up a game here that I got a bone to pick with you, man. Not in a bad way, but you know that NCAA basketball game, the one in 2003, where mm-hmm. Syracuse beat my boys, the Longhorns, in that semifinal game right before Syracuse won the national championship. But, and I know you called both of those games. So tell me, what was it like calling that semifinal game and then the NCAA championship game? Well, you remember that year, Syracuse was at that time in the Big East, and the Big 12 was probably, I think it was widely considered the best college basketball conference in, in America that year. Which was strange, and, right? Yeah, they were phenomenal. I mean, they had both Oklahoma schools, Texas, Kansas and Missouri, I think they, were, they finished one through five that year in the conference and were all ranked like in the top 15. It was crazy. Syracuse beat every one of those teams. Uh, the, the Orange beat, let's see, Missouri in a big Monday game, and then Oklahoma and Oklahoma State early in the tournament. 
and then played Texas and Kansas in the Final Four down at Orleans. So, yeah, I, I used to make the joke all the time that uh, I'm not sure what was more impressive, winning the national championship or the Big 12 championship that year for Syracuse. But uh, that, that, was, that was awful fun. And there are plenty of folks down in Texas, there are plenty of folks – uh, in Lawrence, Kansas, that uh, when they find out what I did in the previous lifetime here, uh, are never really fond of seeing me because it brings back bad, uh, some bad <laughs> memories. Well, I'm telling you, I mean, it must have been so cool calling both of those games. Now, I tip my hats to you guys for getting that win there, but I got to say, man, that was the closest that Texas made it. And I was like, man, Carmelo Anthony had yep. to stop our run. I mean, basically, he basically ran away with that game. He was phenomenal. He was the most outstanding player of the Final Four. If he makes you any, feel any any better, uh, this year in the NIT, I was with the Buffaloes. We were down uh, taking on the Texas Longhorns. They knocked the Buffs in the third round of the NIT. Out. That, that probably doesn't make up for it, but at least at least Texas beat the team I was broadcasting. There you go. Hook them horns. Way to give it back to Mark on that one. Awesome. Okay, so I want to ask you this before we really get into the topic here. This is the last question about announcing. Because I think this is just, for me, it's just so cool. I mean, I'm kind of geeking out right now talking about this stuff. What's the craziest thing that you've ever said when calling a game? And and let me preface it with this. Um, I called a state playoff game as a high school game, and I told somebody that was in the booth, I said, hey, if we pick up a fumble from the other team, if we recover a fumble, I'm going to say what the guy said in Necessary Roughness. I'm going to say, fumbleaya fumble ruski and they're like no you're not and it actually happened and i did it and they looked at me like i can't believe you said that well you know <laughs> i've always said you know in doing all the uh the radio and tv and the public speaking that i do if you stick a microphone at somebody in some front of somebody's face long enough they're going to say something stupid right so I, i've said plenty of things that uh shall we say were never intended to be inappropriate, but they ended up being inappropriate on the air, if you understand what I'm saying. Right, right. Uh, I've said things like that where somebody will, will, on social media will say, I can't believe you just said that. I had no idea what I had said. So there, there are those kind of things that have come out. I've uh, butchered the English language at different times. So uh, all the hours I've spent behind a microphone in front of a television camera, yeah, eventually you're going to say something stupid. And it's just a matter of time. If you haven't done it, uh, just wait. It's coming your way. <laughs> So are you saying what I said was stupid? I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was funny. That okay. was funny. But, uh, you know, I, I, I've, tried, I've tried, you know, where I, something I thought was funny and it didn't quite come out the way right. I thought it would. And so it never, you know, there, there are all kinds of great examples of, of uh, missteps, shall we say, uh, on the air, verbally speaking, uh, when you do it a ball game. And so, and, and on top of the fact that it's happening so fast, like right. I talked about. Yeah. And that's what makes it, I think... It's going to happen regardless, but because the pace of what you're doing is so fast and you're thinking about a thousand different things at once while you're trying to describe the game, something odd is going to come out at some point in time. Yeah, you're right. It does happen at light speed, and and, for, and at the pace that you're at, the level that you're at, I could just imagine it's just exponentially faster. So um, let's get into the topic here, how to embrace your brokenness. And, and Mark, this is something that can be tough to accept, and I'm talking here for myself, especially for men, because we have a tendency to get off, to give off this aura that we have it all together, that we no, don't, no that. you know, that we don't need anyone's help, and this ends up pushing others away and then causing us to be distant from the Lord. So, where in reality, when we embrace our brokenness, and, and I know you know this, we become more whole because we yeah. realize who makes us whole is Jesus Christ. So. I want to start out with the term brokenness. What would you say you define brokenness as? That's a great question. Um, You know, Jim, we all come from, there was a coach I worked with years ago who always had the line, he said, uh, if somebody's normal, if you think somebody's normal, you just don't know them well enough. Mm. And and one thing, and I he was talking about it in one context. I'm using it in the context of the question you're asking, because I think we have got a tendency to look at others and think, boy, that man or woman's really got it together. They're successful. Uh, they've got a happy family. They've got you know a three car garage and a white picket fence and all. The, they show up on church on Sunday. They must be awesome all the time. Right. And. It's been, I think, been added to in this world with social media, which uh, Nick Foles, the, the quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles a few years ago, called it called social media highlight reel. That's only what he puts on there as a highlight reel. And so I think the enemy uses that for us to kind of lie to us, that, that somehow if we've got something wrong, if, if, if we've got a flaw, if we've got hurts, if we've got anger issues, whatever they might be, that somehow 
we're odd. We're, we're not normal out there. Because, man, I look around, I see so many people have just got it together and are so successful. And that's what's one of the great lies I think the enemy tells to us. And so, uh, to, to me, what broke is, brokenness means is we, we've all got our hurts. Uh, as Paul wrote, we've, you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all got our issues. We've all got our scars. You know, we all come from, from backgrounds where... You know, nothing was, was perfect, obviously, because we don't live in a perfect world. And so we carry those scars with us and move forward with them. And so part of my ministry is talking to men about that. I, I come from, I'm sure we'll get into it, I come from some very uh, extreme circumstances at different times in my life that huh? I had to walk through and learn through and ask the Lord to come in and to heal me through. And, and so I talk to guys about accepting that. I, I tell men all the time, there is no sin in being broken, uh, in being hurt, and being scarred. If we live in that, as you're kind of talking about, and we don't look for a way and look for the Holy Spirit's help to guide us through that, that that's when it becomes sinful, when we're living in that, not accepting the help that, that Christ is offering and, bounding, and binding up our wounds. And so I guess for me, that's what brokenness would be. I like that explanation there. And, and here is something I, I can tell you right now. I think you're reading my notes here because my next <laughs> question is leading right into, was there a defining moment? when you accepted your own brokenness? Break that down for me a bit, if you could. Hmm. That's such a great question in, in terms of narrowing it down. I'll say this, and, and, and for your listeners, uh, when I was 18 years old, my father committed suicide. Okay, and there, There's not hmm. many more uh, impactful uh, events that can happen in somebody's life than, than for a young man to have that happen. And, and that scarred me for a long time. And I, mm. you know, if I walked around and, and couldn't understand why I was doing relatively well, I was climbing the ladder, uh, I had a you know, beautiful wife and children, everything was going along like I could have, uh, only could have hoped for. Uh, maybe not as fast as I wanted as a young man, but, but it was moving in a positive direction. And yet I'd find myself on a beautiful Sunday afternoon with my wife and kids and would be out running for ice cream or whatever it might be, and I'd have a knot in my chest, and I could not figure out where the, this, this knot, this, this pressure, this anger, whatever you want to call it. And I, I've talked to a lot of men over the course of time that have experienced some of those same kind of symptoms, but I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. Well, for me, what I had done was, you know, taken my dad's suicide and all the anger that went along with that and all the hurt and all the abandonment and all the other things that I went through and just kind of, I John Wayne it, man. I shoved it down as far as I could mm. and just said, I'll be fine. And I tried to move on. Now, along with that story comes the fact that and why I'm so passionate about ministering to men is that here I'm as 18 years old, father commits suicide, kind of, kind of lays it on me and says, hey, I, I couldn't handle this. You've got to take care of this now. And so I'm walking around with all that heaviness around me, and I didn't have uh, an, an older man, kind of a Paul Timothy type situation. I didn't have a Paul come up to me, put his arm around me, just say, hey, I'm not your father, but I'm here. I'm here to listen. I'm here right. to talk. I'm here to answer questions. Whatever you need, I'm here for you. And, and I needed that desperately at that point in time, and that, that did not happen. And so I had to walk a little bit longer journey, and what that did then was affect my marriage because I, I had shoved all this down. So instead of you know being soft to my wife and tender to my wife and, and giving her my heart, I was, I was protecting this stone I had in my chest that I was you know, holding in and all that kind of thing, and, and I just about blew my marriage up. And, and my wife's a good-hearted woman. She's a wonderful woman who, who has got great compassion and great love, and I wasn't following the biblical instruction that I was supposed to, because I didn't know it, to kind of meet her where she needed to be met and be a godly husband to her. And so um, when I just about blew my marriage up, when for the first time in my married life I looked at my wife and didn't see hurt or anger or, or love, I, I saw an I don't care attitude. Hmm. And, and that's when, when I finally, when the Lord finally tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, I've been trying to get you to deal with this for a long time, and you haven't. It's time. And so I think that was probably about midway through my marriage life when I finally said, okay, Lord, you've got you to gotta take this over and you've got to help me find my way out. Now, when, you, when that uh, happened to your father, when, when he committed suicide, and I'm, and I'm so sorry to hear that, I mean, you're at this critical juncture in your life sure. at 18 years old where you're, where you're going from, okay, you're kind of getting out of high school. I don't know if you were, you were just getting out of high school or a year out or, or how that worked, but you're about to take this next step in college or the next path and kind of doing your own thing. Did you ever think that maybe you were less than or you're not good enough or there's something wrong with you? Oh, sure. I mean, you ask every one of those questions. Um, I think back to that point in time, 
And I was just, I, I've, got, I've got a friend of mine that's, that's I never had a, a biological brother, but there's a good friend of mine who lives up in Minneapolis who is, who is my brother as much as, as anybody's biological brother is. And he and I have leaned on each other through uh, high tide and low tides for our entire life. And, and he and I have talked about that. In fact, I was just with him a couple of weeks ago talking about this very subject. Because we, we, we kind of started remembering back at that time. Because he, he was uh, another 18-year-old trying to help me through. So we're just two kids trying to figure it out. But right. um, I asked every one of those questions you just asked. You know, Was it me? Was there something wrong with me? Am I not enough? Um, what does it mean to be a man? How do I... You know, I thought my father was the, the model for me, and then he, he killed himself. So what does that say about me? I'm part of him. Um, you ask all those questions. And I, and I don't... I don't think for a long time I had an answer to any one of them. And, and then, by the way, don't don't think the enemy's not. You know, I was trying also along with with trying to figure out how to be a man. I'm trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus at that point in time as well. I'm a young man getting out right. of the world. I was a freshman in college, playing college basketball, and and trying to figure this whole thing out. So, I think every one of those doubting questions you can come up with at one point or another, I asked myself over the course of that time. And you know, there were some, uh, shall we say, hollow moments. Uh, trying to deal with that for for a number of years. Mm. You know, I'm going to read a verse here real quick. It just kind of something that came to me. Uh, Psalm 34:18. It says, "The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit." And men unplugged. If you're dealing with something right now, if you feel like your spirit's crushed, or you know, man, you just feel less than, or, or this story like Mark's talking about, there's some something happened in your life. Maybe it's in the past, or it's now that you're you're afraid or you just don't want to fully embrace that brokenness. What Mark and I are talking about today, we need to embrace that brokenness. You have to embrace it so that you can be whole and free in Christ. We have to do that. So what are some things that you learned from those experiences that will help our fellow brothers here that are listening to the program live through this brokenness so they can accept it to be whole as children of God? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, to kind of take you back to that moment um, when, when I finally had that, that turning point or that, that epiphany, if you will. and uh, that, that night when I thought I'd blown everything up and I thought, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking to my wife, trying to figure out why she's not happy with me. I'm, I'm a great guy. I'm a good guy. I'm making a nice living. I've got her a nice house in the mountains of Colorado and all these different things. Just, just puffing myself up, Jeff, like crazy, right? Right. And in that moment, that's when, now, now I say God spoke to me. I didn't, I didn't hear an audible voice, but the, the voice in my heart was as loud as you hear my voice right now. And what he said to me was, you are a good man. You're just a terrible husband. Mm. So that, that was the moment when, when I kind of came crashing down. And uh, Oswald Chambers writes about having an encounter with Jesus. And he, he says uh, in, in his book, and if anybody hasn't read his, his great book, uh, My Utmost for uh, Your Highest. I love that book. It's phenomenal. And, and there's some great truth in there. And he, he, was, he died a young man, but he was a phenomenal man of God. But he talks about when you have an encounter with Jesus, that it is the most um, undressing moment you'll ever have in your life. It's the most bearing of your soul moment. You can't hide anywhere. I, I think I tell men a lot of times, I think that's why we, we shy away about truly committing a lot of times to Jesus, because it is so unnerving. I think that's mm. the word that, that Chambers uses, unnerving, because you can't hide there. We can hide in society. We, we can hide behind a facade. We can hide behind a nice suit. We can hide behind a nice job. We can hide behind a nice, nice car, being on the right club, showing up at church every Sunday. We can hide there, and we can put on a front. When you face Christ, there are no secrets. And, and that's the thing that I learned in all of that. And, and the thing that I feared most was the thing that I needed most. Because when I came through the other side of that, and I thought, it's okay to admit I'm angry. I'm angry at my father. I'm angry at all the men that were, were in my life back then, my uncles, my grandfather, whoever was around me that didn't step up. It's okay to admit that I'm, that I'm angry about it. It was okay to admit, admit that I was terrified of it. It's okay to admit that when I got married and we started having kids, I didn't know how to be a man or, or how to walk or what, what to do or, or how, to, how to father properly, and it was okay for me to not understand all of that. But it wasn't okay for me to hide behind it. And, and so I'll encourage the men unplugged, guys, find somebody. There are great men's groups. I, I talk at men's groups at churches all the time. 
There are there are clubs. There are conferences. Uh, there are, there are places you can connect with guys on a godly level and be able to talk about this stuff. And Jeff, that, that's the thing that gets me. The more I talk to men, the more I'll get a call or an email from somebody. And just not long ago, I I, I got a call from a guy, a very successful guy. He says, "Can we go out and have coffee?" We not had coffee, and I we're so. After the small talk, I said, okay, what's going on? He says, I'm terrified. Mm. I said, of what? He, he said, I got up this morning, and I stood in the shower, and I cried for a half hour at 5 a.m. in the morning when my family was still sleeping. I said, what are you scared of? He said, everything. And I think that's more common. The more I talk to guys, I think that's more common than, than any of us want to admit. But it, it's what we need to talk about man to man and lean on each other with the Holy Spirit's help and look for that. Number one is to bring into the light. Okay? Right. There are no secrets in the light. You bring into the light, you talk about it, and that's where God and the Holy Spirit are going to do their work in your life to help you deal with that. Because as I came through this, once I got to the other side, I'm more trusting in the Lord. I'm more um, willing to, for change in my life. I'm more willing to sit back and go, you know what? I don't have an answer here, Lord, but I know you do, and, and I'm just going to trust in that. And I'm going to listen, I'm going to try and find the answers in your word, and I'm just going to keep moving in your direction every single day. And I, you know, it's, it's, it's as simple as Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. I mean, that, that really is as simple as it is. If I seek the Lord every single day, and I'm leading with my heart, he's going to take control. And that's, that's what every one of us needs to learn. Hey, I can tell you're getting fired up here. So I was going to ask you, what fires you up about this thing, but... I don't have to ask you. You just told me. <laughs> this is awesome. Well, and, and, and Jeff, I tell you, the thing about it is, you know, I'll, I'll get out and I'll talk to, a, I, I spoke to a men's group, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, I guess it was, and I'm standing up on stage, and there was probably 100 guys out there. And, and when I'm up there speaking, I'm looking th- across that crowd, and the Spirit's leading me, and I can see the guys that are where I was previous to the Lord kind of, kind of tapping me on the shoulder. Right. I can see it. I, I can see it in their eyes. I can see it in their demeanor. And I know they're right where they, they don't want to be, but they're going to they're gonna dig their heels in and stand there, and they're going to they're gonna continue to play tough, and they're going to deny it. And then I can see the guys who's you know, they got their, their heart open and their ears open, and they're just saying, man, I'm looking for answers. And, and I, I love that where those guys are at, because a lot of times afterward they're coming up and they're encouraging and they get, they're excited. And the other guys, a lot of times, will just kind of slowly walk out of the room. And, and, and those guys give me reason to pray every, every single event that I do. I just pray over those guys. Because I know that, you know, listen, all apples ripen at different rights. And the Lord's working on each one of us. But I know at some point it's going to happen for those guys. Because they were there. They wanted to be there. Something called them there to be at, at one of those kind of events and have those kind of topics. And listen to the words that are being spoken. And listen to the prayers. So I know they're going to get there. But, boy, it just breaks my heart that they don't, they don't get there quicker. But... Like I said, it's it's uh, everyone's on their own pace and on God's timing, and I just uh, hope that any of your guys that are listening, who have been kind of feeling this way, are, are coming to a point. And maybe maybe our conversation here today can kind of kind of break that heart open and say, "Man, I'm I'm ready to to just jump in the deep end of the pool and let the Lord uh, kind of take control." Amen to that, and and I know uh, speaking to men too, I can relate with you on that, where you can see it, but at the same time, I'm always wondering, maybe I'm not getting it right. Maybe the Lord has seen something else. You know, that First Samuel 16, 7, a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks sure. at the heart. And it reminds me that, you know, we just all have to keep taking these steps closer to the Lord. Draw near to the Lord and He will draw near to you. And this thing of embracing your brokenness. You know, for me, I, I, and, and I've shared this multiple times on different episodes, but, you know, I came to know the Lord 17 years ago. And I... I had this feeling like I was this ugly duckling, like I didn't measure up, like all my past sins made me unworthy, unlovable, just feeling of brokenness. And it wasn't until I came to accept my faith in Christ and accept that brokenness. I'm talking about really accept it to where, man, it was days and weeks where I was just, I mean, if there were sponges on the floor to be filled up with my tears. I mean, no, I'm obviously exaggerating, but that's how much I purged getting through this brokenness and accepting that, you know, Brennan Manning wrote that book, Ragamuffin Gospel. And he says that we're all ragamuffins and we have to accept that. And once I accepted it, accepted the brokenness, I understood that I was whole in Jesus Christ. He makes me whole. He makes us the new creation. We don't make ourselves a new creation. He makes us. 
a new creation. Hey, Men Unplugged faithful, to get the ultimate shield for you and your family, go to menunplugged.net forward slash eyes, that's E-Y-E-S, and use promo code MENUNPLUGGED to get your first month free of Covenant Eyes internet accountability software. And if you haven't done so already, go to menunplugged.net to sign up for our weekly email. You'll get firsthand information about all of our shows, resources, and the chance to offer your own valued feedback about the show. And to be one of the first ones to get a discounted copy of my upcoming book, go to menunplugged.net to sign up to our email list. Why are guys not wanting to accept this brokenness? Well, I, I think probably pride has a lot to do with it. Um, I, I think, you know, <laughs> you know we haven't, we've mentioned it a couple of times, but, you know, the, the enemy uh, does a great job of keeping us and trying to distract us. Um, you know, is it Matthew, the, the cares of the world, deception of wealth? Uh, we'll, we'll kill the seed as he's talking about the parable of the seeds. Right. And, and I think so, as long as the enemy can keep us distracted, as long as he can keep us fearful, we don't want to deal with this. Mm. And we're scared of it because, you know, being, being exposed, if you will, is really uncomfortable for anybody. Okay. Right. And, and I think there's, there's a lot of them that, yeah, boy, if, if I tell people about this, they're going to think I'm kind of strange. They're going to tell me, uh, you know, they're going to think less of me. They're not going to want to do business with me. They're not going to, the woman I'm with isn't going to want to be me, whether it's my wife or, or my girlfriend, whatever it might be. I, I think there are, there are a myriad of reasons, but it all basically kind of boils down to fear. I think why we, we don't want to dive into the deep end. Because, like I said, it's unnerving. When you get, when you get face-to-face with the Lord and you're willing to lay down and just lay there prone and let him uh, expose everything into you, that, that becomes a, it's, a, it's an unnerving process. And I think it's uncomfortable for everybody. The, the problem is that that's a lie to us. Because right. when we get to the other side of this, Jeff, it, it's, it's the one most wonderful experience you're ever going to have. Amen. It's freeing. It's, it's uh, calming. You feel love. You, you don't have the same fears. You don't have the, the thoughts of inadequacy. All those kind of things we talk about, when you're on the other side of this thing, uh, set you free. And, and that's why it's, it's, it's such a great lie the enemy tells us. You mentioned something there I think it was so big, the word exposed. We feel exposed like yep. they found me out. They, yep. Somebody else knows that I don't have it all together. You know, I, I tell guys all the time when I talk to them, um, when I get up on stage, I tell them, I say, listen, I, I don't have all the right answers. I'm going to stand up here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you my story. I'm going to tell you uh, some of the issues I've had. I don't have all the right answers. I've just got a lot of wrong answers I can share with you. Mm. And, and, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's a unique way to go about it. I always tell guys, I'm not trying to condemn you, but I do hope that you're convicted by the time we walk out of here. And, and my, my only goal when I talk to guys is just, just to get them thinking. Get them thinking about it from a heart level so that they'll go to the Lord and say, you know what, I, I don't want to do this anymore, man. I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm fearful. I'm exhausted of trying to live up to something that I'm not. I'm exhausted of trying to play a role. I just want to be the man that, God, you created me to be. Set me free and let me be that, that man. Because I'll tell you what, fellas, when we get to the other side of this, and, and we are, I mean, uh, what is it, uh, Psalm 119.32, I walk in the path Ooh. of your commands, for you have set my heart free. Amen, brother. Now, when, when I stumbled upon that verse years ago, I thought to myself, I really sat down and prayed about that. A friend of mine said, what does that mean to you? And I thought, I walk in the path of your command, for you have set my heart free. What that said to me was, I can't walk in, truly in the path of God's commands. I can't walk according to God's will until my heart is free. Amen. So, fellas, we've got to go to the Lord. We've got to ask Him for that release. We've got to ask Him for that healing. We've got to admit it all and lay it all on the table and say, Lord, I don't know what to do with this, but I know you do. And when we get to that, then we can be mighty warriors for God because that's when He's truly going to use us. Dude, I just got goosebumps. You know why? Because you just shared the verse that's one of my favorite verses. It's on, a, my, it's on my keychain. Psalm 11932. It's a verse that I've talked about before, and you're right on, brother. I mean, it says to walk in the path of his commands yep. because he set our hearts free. And here's the cool thing about that. You're walking in the path of his commands because your heart's free, like you said, but that means because your heart's free, 
you want to do it and you do it easily than if your heart is not free. It's not a burden to you. It's a blessing to you to walk in the Lord's commands. Yeah, Jeff, it, it's one of the great in Christianity that I talk to people about all the time. People that don't, are not believers, they don't get it. They, they don't understand. What, what are you talking about? When you surrender to the Lord, you have freedom. If you're surrendering to them and he's controlling you, how is that freeing? It's one of the great paradoxes in Christianity. Well, you know, every, everything about Jesus was, was opposite of the world, right? Right. I mean, and, and so it's one of the great things that for people that don't believe, it's hard for them to understand that if I do surrender to the Lord and he has healed me and I'm just saying, hey, I'm yours, Lord, do with me what would you will. Here I am, Lord, right? Right. Uh, that that's the most freeing thing in the world, and it's, it's one of the most liberating things you'll ever go through. And it's one of the hardest things for non-believers to understand. But, fellas, if, you're, if you haven't made that step, yet, I'm here to tell you, man, it is awesome once you do that. Once he's in control, it is phenomenal and is the most freeing thing you're ever going to go through. And I, uh, I, I just pray that, that all of you are able to make that step and, and have the Holy Spirit lead you there. Amen. So, okay, so we got some ideas here on what we need to do, how we can get to that point. Obviously, we need to follow the Lord's commands. And how we get there is by surrendering our life to Christ, meaning trusting Him for everything. If we trust Him for 80% of our lives, then we're not really trusting Him for everything, right? Exactly. We have to trust Him for everything. <laughs> this isn't a buffet here. Right. You don't decide, I like the, the snow peas, but I don't like the Brussels sprouts, right? <laughs> I mean, is that a personal is. preference? Is that a personal preference? You don't like exactly. Brussels sprouts? <laughs> that's not what this is about. You can't say, well, Lord, I'm going to give you my finances, I'm going to give you my job, I'm going to give you my marriage, but this little thing over here, I like to keep that in secret. That's not the way this works, Okay. Well, when you, when you surrender yourself, you're surrendering everything and letting him deal, deal with everything. So you're right. You, it's, it's not an 80-20 kind of thing. It's a 100-100 kind of thing. It's got to be 100%. Uh, you give 100%, the Lord is certainly going to give you 100%. So let's say for the man right now that's listening, that let's say he's there, that he surrendered his life to Christ. Mo- most of our listeners are believers. What can they do? What's some practical stuff that they can do, Mark, that maybe from your own experience, so that they can maintain living, embracing this brokenness so they can live whole? What can they do? Well, I'll tell you this. When, when, when I mentioned I nearly blew my, my marriage up, it was kind of the turning point for me a number of years ago. Um, I was here in Colorado, and uh, I went to Bill McCartney, the, the great football coach from right. the University of Colorado. Oh, yeah. I had and, a chance to sit next to him in an event once. That was cool. Oh, he's, he's phenomenal. He's phenomenal. And, and I did that, and <laughs> we're sitting in a, in a coffee shop, and the number one thing he said to me at that time was he said, in, in that, that typical, if you're a Mac when he's coaching, he's got this growl to his voice, and he says, you got to be in the Word every day. Mm. And, and I tell you what, that, that's just number one right there. Um, you've got to be in the Word. You've, you've got to be there every single day. There's no excuse. There's no, um, you know, well, I was busy, and I, you know, I, I had a guy who had an event years ago ask me a question one time. He said, he goes, you know, I just don't have time. And I said, really? And he said, well, what should I do about that? And I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, I know you're a busy guy. We're all busy. But I said, I said I'm assuming you're a believer. And he said, certainly I'm a believer. And I said, okay, when it's all said and done, if, if you claim that you're putting Christ first, how can you say there's no time? Mm. Mm, man, that's big. I, I said, I said that there's, a, there's a contradiction there. Mm. And I said, you know, just like you and I were just talking about uh, the previous question you asked me, if 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 you're going to surrender all, you're going to surrender all. Right. Um, you know, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, you know, uh, what, whatever man uh, treasures is going to be, you know, is going to be what he what he focuses on. I mean, you know, there are all kinds of Bible verses and sayings and quotes and that, that, that kind of direct uh, that that kind of concept. Uh, so you you're either he's either first or he's or he's not. And and so you've got to be there every single day. That has to be a commitment. It's got to be as 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 natural as breathing every single day for you. No, I like that. And I would add to that, do it first thing in the morning. I found, yeah. and I don't know if you can relate with this or not, but I found that if I don't do that first thing in the morning, next thing you know, my day gets out of, you know, just takes over. And then I'm done with the day. I go to bed and I'm like, I didn't even read any scripture. I didn't even have a chance yeah. to pray. You know, and, and that's your other thing. You know, when, when, when Paul wrote, pray without ceasing, um, your, your, your breathing should be prayer. 
Right. Uh, that's, that's what we need to get to. That's what Paul was calling us to. You've got to be in the Word. You've got to have a, an open conversation all day long. I mean, everything you're going through, everything you're doing, everything you're involved in, every decision you're making, every business deal uh, you're part of should be part of, of your prayer life. Um, because because if, if the Lord's going to be number one, if that's going to be what you're committed to, everything's going to go through that filter. And so that's got to be, I think, kind of the, the screen which everything is cast upon, always. No Absolutely. Matter matter, you know? I don't care if you're a mechanic, if you're a... Um, you know, a dentist, if you're a sportscaster, if you you do podcast, what, whatever it is. I mean, everything has to be there. That's got to be number one. You know, I, I tell people all the time that, you know, I'm a sportscaster, but please don't identify me as that. Right. You know, I want to be identified as a follower of Christ. That's what I want to be identified as, who, by the way, is a sportscaster. And so uh, maybe start recalibrating how you think about yourself and how you think about your life. Share with me the circumstances, Mark, that led to your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Well, for, for me, um, I say, I tell during my testimony all the time, I came from a family that went to church when they were supposed to, you know, Christmas right, and right. Easter and somebody's funeral and somebody's wedding. And, and that's not to criticize my parents. It's just the way it was. Um, something as a child didn't seem right to me about that. And I remember as a 10-year-old going to my mom and dad saying, hey, can I, can I go to church? Can I go to Sunday school? And well, what for? I just, I just want to go. So I didn't know why. I didn't know what I was doing or why I was doing it. But... I just felt called, and so I went and uh, learned some things, and, and you know, was, didn't didn't have a clue why. I mean, I knew the details, but it took me into into my 30s when when I was trying to navigate this. And we talked about you know my dad and all that kind of stuff, but I'm trying to navigate all this, trying to figure out what it means to be a Christian, and then eventually um, having that public job was a little afraid to go public with my faith and. So it was probably when my oh, about 34, 35, I felt that tap on the shoulder where he just kind of said, uh, you know, because we all know what he says about lukewarm. Right. Are you in or out? Right. And, and that's when I, I said, well, no, I'm in, but I'm scared. And, and he said, well, trust in me. And so then I, I started going and being public with my faith. Um, it was unnerving. I, I, it, it certainly has affected my career. There's no doubt about that. Right. In many respects, from an earthly standpoint, negatively. But uh, I trusted in it. And, and continued to follow him, was very public in my faith, and then obviously became that turning point a number of years ago in my marriage, and that, that really kind of made me really take off. But, but that's kind of the progressive uh, journey, I think, that I had. So you talked about, in some instances, your faith has been negative in your career. Can you highlight that? Yeah, well, I, I, had, uh, I worked for a very large broadcasting company uh, for a number of years and was called in many times. And because of, uh, you know, on social media, wherever it is, uh, I was expressing my faith. And they said, you got to be careful about that. And I said, well, listen, that's, that's in my own time. Uh, that's what's number one in my life. I'm not going to be shy about I'm never going to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm right. going to proclaim it from the mountaintops. And so it, it has affected me. Um, I eventually was, was let go by that company and, and don't have any explanation as to why. <laughs> One day, just, and I said, well, what, why? Well, here's your papers. Uh, just move on. Oh, man. <laughs> so so I, I, I think I've, I've not gotten circumstances um, with, within certain broadcast circles and certain offices. Uh, I was negatively referred to as the Jesus guy and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and listen, I'll wear that as a badge of honor uh, anytime. Amen. Uh, the Lord told us that uh, we are going to have trials, but He has overcome the world. I believe in that every every single moment of the day. Mm. Well, you talked about right there. You started to share it, but Romans one sixteen: For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of mm. God unto salvation for all those who believe. It doesn't say the power of man; it says the yeah. power of God. It's a Amen big, big difference right there. So, hey, brother, I want to commend you for that for just standing firm because the platform that you have, you can easily buckle. And, you know, surrender to what society says. So I want to commend you for standing firm to that, Mark. I really do. Well, you know, I've always said, you know, here's the thing. Um, Because we know what the Word says about that. Right. If if we're hiding our love for Christ, if that's not first and foremost, what what did Jesus say? If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Absolutely. And and, and, listen, man, that's gospel right there. And the last thing I ever want is is to stand before him someday and have him say, you were ashamed of me, hmm. uh, and I'm, I, I, you know, I don't ever listen. We, we're all we all have our moments of, of fear and some of the 
stories in the Bible of the apostles tell us that, but uh, I'm, I'm never going to, as, 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 as far as I can tell you, I'm never going to do that. And uh, so I'll stand strong uh, every, every single time. So I, I, I pray for strength in all those circumstances. Man, I love that. I really do. If this is your first time listening to the show, I want to encourage you to check out episode 76. That is an interview that I had with the producer of Tortured for Christ, and we talked really in depth about how you can stand firm even in the midst of persecution. So I want to ask you this. So your greatest victory is your salvation in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Tell me about one or two maybe more recent victories that you've seen the Lord um, get you through. Uh, interesting. Well, I'll tell you, what, the most obvious one of my life is this. I've got three children. Uh, my youngest is 22 years old. He is mostly disabled. Um, mm. He transports in a wheelchair. He's very toddler-like. Uh, without getting too graphic, but just to give your, your listeners a sense, my oldest son will be 28 years, 28 years old here shortly. So uh, my wife and I have been, been changing diapers for 28 years. So I think oh, you man. Get a sense of what I'm getting at. Right, yeah. Um, the greatest yeah. victory in, in, in all of that, I think, is the fact that I, I say all the time, my son's name is Jacob. He's the, the greatest blessing I never would have asked for. Because if you, mm. you know, we're around that, that world of disabilities a lot, that community, and it's uh, the divorce rate is off the charts. There's a lot of hurt and a lot of a lot of things that go into that. Um, but because of God's strength and the Holy Spirit's guiding, Jacob, I think, has taught my wife, my family about sacrifice and about laying down your own life and about uh, caring for those less fortunate and all those kind of things and patience. Uh, you got to be very patient with Jake. Right. Um, so all of those things, that, that's probably one of the great victories in my life. And I can honestly say my 22-year-old disabled son is the one that has taught me about it. And I don't think there's any doubt about it that the Holy Spirit works through him on a daily basis to, to both purify my wife and me. Uh, no doubt about it. Wow. Wow. So let's say you're calling the biggest game. What would you say the biggest game to announce? Maybe the, the Super Bowl? Would you oh, say sure. that's yeah, the, that's okay. Sure. Yeah. So let's say you're calling the Super Bowl. Producers said you can say anything that you want. We're going to give you 30 seconds to a minute to say anything that you want. What would you say that would be encouraging for everyone to hear? Well, I, I think what I would do, I would tell them of my brokenness that I've shared with you, the man unplugged here today. And I would, I would, it's, 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 you're asking me to put a lot into about 30 seconds or 60 seconds. <laughs> okay, I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> but what I do, I would quickly share the brokenness that I have had in my life through my father's suicide, my son, all the different things my wife and I through, and that I stand before them victorious because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and he has freed me of all of that. And I know that of the millions listening around the world right now, you're feel for, fearful, you're uncertain, uh, you, you don't know where to go or where to turn, and that the freedom given you in surrender to Jesus and letting him lead your life is the most freeing. It's like a breath of fresh mountain air as I stand up here in the Rocky Mountains mm. right now. Mm. I think that that's the basic message I would give them. Mm, I love that. Okay, last parting tip of wisdom. Hmm. Don't ever pass up an opportunity to interview somebody. Mm. And what I mean by that, and I'll tell you a great, just a great little anecdote. I was at an event here a couple of weeks back, and there was a gentleman uh, from New York who was the opposite of just about everything you and I are talking about here today. His lifestyle, uh, what he believed in, and through the course of this event, we get to the end of it. His name was Paul, and he came up to me afterward, and he, he had tears in his eyes, and he said, I didn't think I'd ever get to really know somebody like you and i said what do you mean and i'm this big guy in a cowboy hat and outdoorsman and all these different things that i do and very conservative and believe in jesus so i was the opposite of this guy and said i've never met anybody like you who is nice to me wow and i said well paul i believe in jesus as my lord and savior my only job is to love you my job is not to judge you and what you do and what you're involved in it doesn't matter to me and and so uh, all I did that entire week was just talk to him. Where are you from? What's going on in your life? What's happening? What's, what's, what's been good for you? And, and so I've always believed, don't ever miss an opportunity 
to interview somebody. Because when you interview somebody and you're showing interest in them, you're showing that you care about them and you love them. And I, I think there's phenomenal power in that. Oh, man, I love that, man. That goes right into my evangelism training book. I told you it's being published this summer because I have a chapter in there. It's called Just Ask. Sure. You just ask, man. Hey, you know, I might exactly. put that quote in the book if that's all right. I'll give you, you right I'll give you props for it. You go right ahead. <laughs> all right, Mark, thank you so much for being on the show today, man. This was a real blessing and honor. And you know what? I'm fired up. So, Men Unplugged, I hope you've been fired up. Mark, thanks again, brother. You bet. I look forward to doing it again sometime. All right, brother. Hey, Men Unplugged, that wraps up today's show. But I want to ask you this one question. Do you want to stay up to date on everything that we're doing here at Men Unplugged, as well as the updates about my upcoming evangelism training book and how you can get a discounted copy of that? Go to menunplugged.net and sign up to our email list. Just click that sign up now button and you're off to the races as part of the Men Unplugged community. Until next time, stay plugged in and recharged. God bless. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. There's plenty more to see at menunplugged.net, including key resources and ways to engage with Jeff in his training and speaking forums. While there, don't forget to subscribe and receive a free gift. We look forward to you joining us next time here on the Men Unplugged Show. Unplugged.